<coughs> Mentoring at Riga is always an interesting experience. Yesterday, I started mentoring students at about 11 o'clock in the morning, and I finished at quarter past 12 at night. And it was an interesting time. And I should have expected it, because every time I come to Riga, the same kind of thing happens. But every time it happens, I'm surprised. So yesterday, um, I was talking to someone, and there was this incredible moment where they said, you know, dude, you're awesome. Um, you know, you've changed my life. And I was like, very moved. And this person walks out. And I'm feeling really good about myself. And in comes in this girl. And she goes, so I hear you come here and do this for free. What's wrong with you? What are you trying to fill in your empty life? I was like, wow, where do I start? My point is that same thing, one person mentoring, and two entirely different perspectives. At the end of the conversation, she walked away, and you could see that, you know, she was happy. So um, I thought I was going to get a good feedback, and I asked her, so how was it? She goes, ah, you say reasonable things in a quiet voice, which I think for her was high praise. Again, I actually think I was better with her than I was with the guy before, but perspective. Today, this conversation is about how do you control the perspective of employers. This conversation is about how do we convince those to, who to some degree will decide our careers, our lives, that we are the best, that we are the ones with the greatest potential that we are the ones that will take their companies, their ideas, their vision to the next level of achievement. Because controlling that perspective, whether it's with an employer, whether it's with a uh, mentor, whether it's with a teacher, is the key to success, or one of the keys to success in this life, if success is defined as becoming wealthy, powerful, famous, respected. So how do we do it? How do we control this perspective? When I started looking at this question 21 years ago, so 1993 was the first time I started mentoring. I started with students who are between the ages of 14 to 18 years old. At a time when traditionally a person is going through a huge amount of changes. It's teenage, your bodies are changing, your mind is developing at a phenomenal rate, and your sense of self is changing. From being a boy and a girl to being a man, a young man or a young woman. And that was the first time that I was challenged with the idea, how do I help these people, who are very young, control their own destinies, drive their own lives, reach their own aspirations? Over the next 21 years, I've mentored a thousand or so boys and girls of that age group. And a remarkable thing occurred. I understood that my greatest battle was not teaching them how to control the perspectives of others. It was to teach them how to control their perspective about themselves. As I learned that, part of me kind of rebelled. Part of me said, no, is it really that? And I started investigating this idea with different age groups. So in 1999, uh, as my own career took off in the financial sector, most of you know my biography, I started out as a private banker, then I became an investment banker. 
in the classical sense of that word, which meant I was doing mergers and acquisitions, IPOs, etc. Then I became a currency trader, a FX trader as it's called, and then I became the strategist for a fairly large American hedge fund. As that career and that trajectory took off, somehow I made, seemed to attract individuals in my new industry, investment banking primarily, to be mentored by me. And it gave me the chance to again look at this. What were their difficulties and what were their issues with controlling their perspectives? And the same thing was arising. <coughs> that these individuals, in this case, uh, I started with two saleswomen in two different American investments. One American investment bank, one Swiss investment bank. And they were having problems of conflict resolution and career stagnation. But again, what we discovered through conversations that, that there was this issue of their own perspective, their own self-worth. Over the next four years, while my career kept on going at more capital, I mentored, God, over a hundred or so people in the financial sector, both at Wall Street and in the UK. And the same thing again and again and again, that there seemed to be this inability to control and define oneself according to one's deepest aspirations. In 2003, I retired, became vice chairman of an environmental charity, spent some time in Tibet, and then went off and founded a few companies. It was in 2006 that through an accident, really, I started mentoring university students. It started at the London School of Economics, from which the book Racing Towards Excellence arose. And over the next eight years, I've spoken to, what, 25, 26,000 students from places like Stanford and Berkeley in the United States, to Oxford, Cambridge, LSE, Warwick, etc. in England, to Portugal, Spain, Latvia, and now I'm speaking to students in Pakistan. Over that period, when we were having conversations, or in this case, dialogues like the one we're having now with large groups, I also started these one-on-one -on -one sessions. And again, the same issue arose. Just in this week here, I will have spoken to over 50 of you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I do that 15 or 16 times a year. So I speak to about 700, 800 students annually, or about 5,000 students over the last eight years on a one-on-one -on -one basis. In all those cases, again, the same issue controlling your own perspective. So what do I mean? I mean that there is this disparity between what I am seeing in them, the potential I am seeing in them, the opportunity I am seeing in them, the skill levels I am seeing in them, and how they are seeing themselves. And especially at SSE Riga, I found this very pronounced. I find I'm looking at someone who is not only doing a degree here, but is also, is there an echo here or is it just me? A little bit, okay. Tell me if the echo stops if I move over here. Better? No? Okay, well we'll try and work it out. If it gets too distracting, tell me, because I think we could do a sound check and you could probably hear me in the back, right? Do you guys want me to do this without the mic? Would that help? Raise your hands if you think without the mic would better. Okay. No, most people think the mic's okay for now. If it changes, just let me know. So, you know, I was uh, mentoring someone here, and, you know, they were talking to me about could they really do this, could they really achieve this, you know, were they really as smart as they thought they were. And this was a person who was not only doing a degree here, but they were doing a second course at another school. And they were doing it together. It was so incredibly smart. Another person had helped create an app that will transform agriculture in this country. Or Estonia to start with, and then over here, hopefully. Remarkable achievements for people of your age. 
And yet in both cases, there was this divergence between how I believed in them, what I saw in them, the opportunities I was discussing with them. There was a guy who came in and casually told me that his average was 165. And he felt like, you know, what could he do to make it better? I was like, dude, that's pretty good. Right? And then there was another guy um, that I was talking to today, and I was saying to him, you know, you should apply uh, for a PhD and, you know, go to Stanford because I lecture there and I think you fit in really well. And he was like, oh, you think I can get in, etc. And I was saying, absolutely. What's interesting, and why I'm going on and on about this, is that so much of the way we affect others happens at a non-verbal level. When we believe in ourselves, people buy us. They don't even know why they do it, they just do it. You've heard of this concept of charisma, right? This sense of just being attracted to people, believing in people, voting for people. Not in a political sense, but voting for them by wanting to hang out with them, voting for them by believing in their projects, voting for them by, you know, helping them. And charisma is what? Charisma is your internal self-belief manifested. Your internal sense of your self-image projected onto everyone else. When that image becomes better, everything becomes better. By everything I mean that if you are going for a job interview, the employer will treat you with a little bit more respect. The employer will give you better tasks to do when you're working there. The employer will become, without realizing it, more nurturing, more helpful, more positive about your future in the company. So, how do we control it? How do we change it? How do we drive it? And the answer isn't easy. The reason the answer isn't easy is because otherwise everyone would do it. The answer relies on three steps. Sometimes they're chronological, sometimes they have to be done at the same time. The biggest and hardest part of the problem is changing your mind. One of the worst things for me as a mentor is the fact that I become very emotionally invested in the people I mentor. And it's actually one of the reasons that I tend to mentor much less on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on a regular level. And what I tend to do is I'll go to universities, I'll go into corporations, in some cases I will advise government ministers, but in all those cases, I will create a boundary on how much time I will spend with the individual. Because I find that when it doesn't work, it hurts me. And one of the things that I can't help it hurts me the most, and unfortunately happens at SSC Riga the same way as happened at other universities, is the moment when I tell the solution to the problem to the student, and the student goes, no, nah, not going to do it. Not because they're disobedient. Not because they are trying to be difficult. But because emotionally they will not accept the change that it will require. And what is this one thing that I keep asking students to change? That some cannot. It is changing the idea of you from being an individual to being part of a team in your life. What is that team? That team is your well-wishers, those who love you. By that I mean your family. By that I mean your friends. When we see ourselves as part of a team, of being a part of a family unit truly, and being part of a friend's unit, we reach out for help. Okay? So for example, if we are struggling with our grades, 
That is the time when we reach out and we say to our friends, dude, help me with this homework. Explain this to me. Then you will not believe the number of times I've had students say, I don't want to ask anyone for help. Why not? Well, I don't want to look stupid. Dude, you're getting 98. That boat has already sailed. Right? But they can't do it. Another one that happens again and again is I've got to take a second job or I've got to take a third job at school or I've got to commute an hour, hour and a half away because I don't want to ask my parents for the thousand euros or the 1500 euros it would cost to buy get a car. And in that particular case, okay, is it because the family's in financial difficulties? No, they have you know, a huge house, mom and dad are quite wealthy, etc. But I want to be independent. And I'm saying you do realize that that extra hour, hour and a half that you could be working, uh, that you could be studying instead, or not doing that second job, could mean the difference between you getting 130 to 140. That difference between pass and merit. And that if you make that difference, the chances of getting that better job go up and you could pay back that thousand or fifteen hundred euros with one month's salary in two years. If you wanted to, you could pay it three, four, five times over. It would be the best return your parents have ever made. Yeah, but I want to be independent now. And the person walks away and a part of you just wrenches inside because you know that there is nothing that can be done when emotional stubbornness kicks in. It's the biggest block that students have, emotional stubbornness. The refusal to see themselves as part of a team, asking for help, whether it's from friends, whether it's from the school, whether it's from their family. When you do not reach out, when you do not ask for help, you're making one very specific statement to the world. What you're saying is you do not believe in yourself. Right? Because if you were brutal and brutally honest, from an economics perspective, if you believed that you would make 5,000, 6,000 euros a month in three to four years because of this help, you could pay these people back, whether it's your family, whether it's helping these friends get better jobs later, a hundredfold. <clears throat> what the universe hears when you do not ask for help is that you do not believe that you are an investable product. That you do not deserve to be invested in emotionally, materially, physically, mentally, the four accounts in the book. And that creates a picture, that creates a emotional identity that when you then go and see employers, they can feel. The number of times I've had employers reject people because they said, well, we just didn't get a good feeling. Or they were not the right fit. Or, I don't know, there was just something. This is the something they're talking about that sense of an emotional stubbornness that they know will manifest in the workplace. That will manifest that when these people are really tired, they are likely to then become more confrontational without realizing it. When you don't allow teamwork to happen in your life at this age, you give a vibe of not being able to work in a team later. And that vibe is picked up. Now, on the good side, and the positive side, is that when this happens, it's amazing. When a person decides to change, it's phenomenal. I know those sound like American words, but you know, the Americans aren't all bad. Um, I had this um, girl uh, mentee recently, so as I said, I hardly ever mentor people, but in this particular case, sometimes my ego takes over. 
And when I see a particularly hard case, I'm like, okay, this one only I can solve. We all have our areas of pride we can't help it. Mine is if I find something that just I know no other mentor could do, then I have to do it. So I met this uh, girl at uh, a leading university. She's still my mentee, so I have to kind of protect her identity a bit. So she's at one of the top universities in the UK. And um, she had a very hard life. I met her when she was 19 years old. And she grew up in a council estate. The way you guys here would know it is like a ghetto. I mean, how, how, how do you guys describe a really, the roughest area in town? Give me a word. <laughs> ghetto is fine? Ghetto is fine? Okay. Or is there a name? Somebody says, shouted something. Not where Beans is, I think it's in a, a fine area. Um, but yeah, so somewhere where it's like a really, really rough part of town. And she grew up, and this is in England, unfortunately, where, you know, the only way to stay away from being pushed into being part of a drug gang was that if you were very sporty. So she started playing football, and because she was playing football with the boys, they kind of protected her from being bullied, from being attacked. And they tried when you know the drug pushers would come in and try to get her to become you know part of their gang, they warned them off and so on. And um, you know, because she grew up in this area, she had huge trust issues and huge issues around being looked down upon by rich people. But somehow, um, somebody at one of the top American investment banks met her and just saw something in her and invited her to come for their Spring Insight Week. And that's when I met her. This was before the Spring Insight Week was starting. Um, do you guys have Spring Insight Weeks here where you go for a week to uh, a company? Okay, so in London and New York, it's very typical that they will bring you in in your first year for a week. On that basis, they will decide if they're going to then have you come in for an internship um, the next year. So she goes in and she's terrified because she goes, all the other kids are rich, they're looking down on me, they think that I'm stupid, um, you know, no one's going to believe that I do good work, etc. There was this huge story she was telling about herself. And we started working together and I started to explain that the story that is told about you is in your power. When you change the way you talk to yourself, other people start listening to that story. And that did start to happen. But she, in her case, has a reality that is pretty intense. So last night, because she's going through this insight week as we speak, I finished here at quarter past 12 for mentoring, and then I get a call from her at 2 o'clock in the morning, because it's 12 in uh, the UK, and she's just finished at the American Investment Bank, and she's walking home and telling me that, you know, she was having some problems at the work. And she goes, uh, Ms. Offer, I'll have to call you back. Um, I don't want to get mugged because I have to run through an alley. That's the kind of place she lives in, where if they see her phone, she's going to get robbed and possibly beaten up. And she has to run through an alley. That's a pretty hardcore. And then she called me back in five minutes. And I said, I appreciate you shared that with me, but you have no idea what went through my mind in the last five minutes, you know, who do I call, the police, you know. The helplessness I felt in that moment, that I can't protect her, I can't look after her, only I know what that felt like. But she called me back and we kept talking and today I got a message from her that our interview went really well and there is a good likelihood that she'll get the intention. That's the good story. And that, when that happens in your life as a mentor, it's an incredible feeling. But it is not my achievement, it's hers. She turned the story around. She believed in herself so much that the story she started with was that she was a poor kid 
who nobody would believe in, who everyone would look down on, to the story she got to, which is, I've had this amazing life journey, I've beaten the odds, I've gone from being one, in one of the poorest places in the world to the richest institution, and I can change and nothing can stop me. And in her interview, they literally said that word for word. They said, and with your permission, I'd actually like to quote it, because um, it came through today and it was like the coolest thing I've heard, which tells you something about how uncool I am, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, so, hold on a second, because to me it was great. She got so excited that she sent me like 20 other messages, so I've got to scroll down a little bit. Oh yeah, here we are. So she said, um, the head of human resources said, you think you're not as smart as everyone else on the program, but you don't realize what we could make of you. You'll break the ceiling, the glass ceiling, in no time, and will have surpassed the smartest person you know on your intention. Two weeks. Because her conversation changed, they changed. That is what is possible. That is what I'm inviting you guys to understand is the consequence of changing that internal uh, conversation. The consequence is a huge paradigm shift in the opportunities that life will bring to you if you guys look at this in the proper way. Today is called a day of opportunities. The opportunities are not just what is being offered out there. The opportunity is for you guys to change yourself so that you are specifically given that opportunity. That you're the one that the employer stops and has the 10 minute conversation with. That you're the one that they say, oh, we think you're perfect for our company. But it requires that change. Now, who wants to, oh, actually, sorry, I was about to give you guys a choice, but then I realized that uh, I've had some bad experience with SSE Riga students. Um, <laughs> and the one experience I've had with SSE Riga students is that they tend to be so shy that when you give them a choice, no one raises their hands, and you can spend 10 minutes just getting them to raise their hands. So we'll, we'll run through this. Uh, uh, in a different way. What I wanted to invite you to do now, just for five or ten minutes before we go on to the next part of this, which is how to turn the advice I'm giving you today into a sustainable injection of positivity. I just want to take a step back for a second and ask you guys if you have any questions, okay? Now the reason I'm doing this is not for any other reason except the fact that around this time half the students fall asleep. So the only way for me to keep them awake is force the guys who are not enough to ask questions. Okay? So go ahead. This is the nightmare part where no one raises their hand. And then veto or someone has to raise their hand. Okay? But that is not allowed this time. See? Only oh there you go. Oh. You rescued me, my savior. Thank you. So, one of the things, before she goes, sorry, is the reason I'm asking you to do this also, and the reason why in American universities, when you do this, they, all of them raise their hands, is very simple. In America, they are taught that every time someone who is rich or powerful or successful, or someone just like me, um, uh, they are an opportunity to create a contact. You will not create a contact with someone if they don't know your name. You will not create a contact with someone if there has been no contact. So you ask a question, and the way they do it, which is really intelligent, well, it's intelligent because I taught them how to do it, um, <laughs> is you start by telling your name, which year you're in, and then you ask the question. So my mind immediately 
categorizes you. So go ahead. Okay, my name is Christina Pilenko. I'm from the second year of studies in SC Riga. Thank you. And uh, yeah, as a background, I'm from Belarus, so it already tells a lot. Uh... <laughs> not, not to me. Um, I'll tell you what it tells to me about Belarus. Uh, in the last um, three days I've been here, I've had five Belarus students that I've mentored. And all of them are incredibly motivated, and Gita and I were actually talking about this at lunch, of how motivated they are, and um, how positive and ambitious they are. So, in my mind, it tells a lot of good things. But go ahead. Okay, so, well, my questions would be the following. You're uh, talking now a lot about the career opportunities and about the way we should possess ourselves in front of employees as, a, as an employee, uh, potential employee, but um, how, how is it possible to combine successful career uh, with also being a successful member of a family? Because, well, for many pe people, career is not the first or the priority. And uh, how, 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 how would you suggest maybe to think of, uh, like, I don't know, prioritizing your time, your effort to these different directions? Because, uh, well, for me personally, it's really hard not to understand how to be successful at the same time in my job and studies, but also thinking of my future in terms of family. Thank you very much. What's interesting is that the answer to that question came to me in two incredibly inspiring conversations that I've had in the last 24 hours in SSE Riga. And they were with two very different women. One was a girl, I think she was a first year. And she talked about the fact of how her dad, her mom passed away, and her dad raised her as a single parent. And how he managed to be this incredible guy who did this great job, um, kept getting promoted in his job, very respected, and still managed to be both a father and a mother to her. And it was just inspiring to hear that story. So I knew about the possibility that it could be done just from this experience. The reason I'm saying this experience is that it would be very easy for me to tell you that it happens in America. It would be easy for me to tell you it happens in England. But it wouldn't give you an honest comparison. So I wanted you to know about it in this region. And then I had this um, great conversation um, with a lady who actually has two children um, and has continued working, bringing them up and has done excellently in her own job. And when I sort of, because I was really interested in the idea, because even today, the majority of the primary carers in a family tend to be the women, the mothers. So I was particularly interested in her story. And what she had done, and she didn't put in those terms, I just translated in my head, was she did exactly the thing that I was inviting you guys to do. She thought of her life as a team. So what they would do is they would send the kids to the parents of, their, uh, of the husband um, when she was working, and they would look after during the day, and then evening they would be together as a family. Over time, as she became also more credible in the workplace, you know, it was absolutely fine that if uh, her daughter had a flute recital or something like that, she could go and um, be there, and the company was like, yeah, an hour, two hours is fine. But that sense of not seeing herself as an individual, as being the only person responsible for the upbringing of her children, was her saving grace. But seeing instead and inviting the love of the grandparents, etc. By etc. I mean that's just her case. In other cases, um, people use you know both sets of grandparents. People use the extended family to work together. Um, there are now, especially in the West, again. I wanted to differentiate because I wasn't sure what the current situation in the Baltics and in Belarus is. There are crashes that work with the timings of the women's jobs. But where there aren't, the invitation to the extended family to come and love and support is an amazing saving grace. So that's how you know, I try to refuse to see being a woman as a hindrance. Instead, in my mind, with my female mentees, it's an invitation for them to see their team in a different way, as this lady, without my help, has been doing for years. Does that answer the question? Okay, 
I'm not going to play, oh, thank you. My God, I am being so well treated today. <laughs> By the way, you know when I keep saying that? It is supposed to be emotional blackmail for the 200 people not raising their hands. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Diana, and I'm a final year student. And I have a question about the uh, so there is this conventional high end career path where you graduate, your bachelor, get your bachelor degree, then you have two or three years in investment banking or management consulting, then you go away and or you found a startup or you do something more meaningful for your life. So um, yes, breaking into management consulting and investment banking is not easy, but this is kind of this mandatory step before you do something more meaningful for your life. And I am very afraid of taking those two years, three years. Why should I take them if afterwards I will definitely do something else? But on the other hand, I understand that I should take those two, three years because this somehow trains you, etc. But this pushes me back uh, from my applications, from my desire to uh, break through those interviews, etc. I want to do that, but I don't see any meaning for that. So I'm just trying to understand Diana, right? Yeah. I'm trying to understand, the actual fear is that if you spend those two to three years working in a management consultancy, that it will delay your ability to start up your own business, is that what you're saying? What's the fear? I, I didn't quite understand the fear. I understood the process, but what was the fear? The fear is that I will spend two to three years of my active, um, like, two to three years in an industry, I will not need afterwards. And during those two, three years, I will not understand what I need, actually, what I want. To start a business? Is that the end goal? No, no, oh, to do something, do something, do something what I love. Ah, I like. okay. So if I may, I'm just going to repeat back how I understood you, just yes. to make sure I did get it. Um, so what you're saying is that at the moment you don't know what you love, so what you are being encouraged to do is to spend two to three years in management consultancy until you find what you love and your fear is that you find that actually you want to be an actress or something and then what was the management consultancy all about? Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry it uh, took me so long to understand that. Uh, how do you find what you love? The answer was given, you search, you apply, you look. Is that what we Look, work, and try. Look, work, and uh, uh, try. Okay. Um, the reason I started to laugh, I'm sorry, was that when I said it aloud, it was a rhetorical question. I wasn't expecting a reply. So, you know, it threw me for a second. I was like, you know, maybe I should sit down and you should. I'm like, whoa. You know, it's like, you know, um, because I am... Um, I'm not what you call a natural speaker, I'm not a gifted speaker, so um, I'm not used to dealing with unexpected situations. <laughs> so suddenly you're like, whoa, my whole like, speech went out the window, I'm like, actually, yeah, maybe that's what we should do, I've been doing it all wrong. Um, that's an interesting theory. Um, I guess my ideas are slightly different. The reason I was being quiet was I was just remembering my own journey. And first of all, Whenever someone asks you a question, and you're a mentor, the most important thing in life is to be honest. Okay? And until you create a bond of integrity with the other person, there will not be trust. Okay? So, I, it was important to me, and I was just trying to find the courage in me to first of all confess something, and then to give an answer. Um, my confession is that what I love happened to me by accident. So I didn't want to give you guys the idea that I had thought through and I had discovered what I loved through the process I'm about to describe. It didn't happen for me that way. It happened to me purely through accident. As it does actually bizarrely enough for most people, but what I did do was because this question was asked of me from 1993, 21 years ago, I've spent over 20 years thinking about it and I've helped other people find what they love. Um, so what I'm about to teach you or tell you comes from my helping others, not my own life. And I want to make that distinction so you understood that. 
to find what you love goes back to the perspective thing. Okay? There's a cliche among the old that when two young people say they love each other, they have no idea what they're talking about. So the old have this prejudice where they, where they call love in your generation puppy love. So they actually put it down. They say, no, that's not love. Why isn't it love? Well, the elderly say, well, I live in my generation. I'm having some issues there. Um, but, it, but my generation say, oh, because you don't know yourself. How can you love when you do not know yourself? Psychologists use, um, dis, you know, disparagingly because some of them don't like the idea of love. So they define love as two neuroses meeting each other. Okay? So two people who have exactly the opposite madnesses meeting each other. And unfortunately, there is um, fiction that popularizes this idea. So many of you will have heard of this book none will admit to reading it, this controversial book called Fifty Shades of Grey. Right? <laughs> Apparently no one has read it, but she sold 50 million copies. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> but, you know. Um, and, um, and what's interesting to me is the number of women who seem to know exactly what's in it, but have never read it. <laughs> um, but that aside, the point is that it's a story. Um, which a psychologist would say a perfect story between a sadist and a masochist. So, and th then the idea of their deep falling in love. So, in psychology, there's this idea of that, you know, it's not the only idea in psychology, and I don't want to disparage all psychologists, that it's neurosis, two neuroses, two dysfunctionalities, which perfectly complement each other. And so the idea of finding what you love also changes. One of the greatest disservices that a mentor can do for you is to encourage you to believe that what you love today, you will love tomorrow. And that becomes the most dangerous road that a person can take. I'm going to confess something to you. I, um, when I started this sort of public speaking, oh God, eight years ago, 2006, I think, were my first sort of speeches to big arenas. I talked about how I love doing this, you know, helping people free, doing all this stuff, and working in charities, blah, blah, blah. And I definitely implied, I never said, but I definitely implied that somehow, when I was a hedge fund guy, I didn't like it so much, that it was horrible, and it was all money, and etc. That is completely untrue. I loved traveling in private jets when I was in my 20s. I loved the fact that I could go into any bar or restaurant and put down my Black American Express card and if necessary buy the restaurant. Because that's who I was. I was incredibly shallow at that age. And so what I loved then, I did. What I loved changed because I changed. Coming back from to the, my values changed, my personality changed, my outlook changed. So, one of the things I always tell mentees is do not become a prisoner of a fear of finding love later. Because whenever you do find love, you will meet it. I'm talking about in terms of your career, right? It's the same idea as, you know, most of you would think it was ridiculous. Um, that, you know, you don't go out and date a guy until you find the one you love, right? That's not how we think, right? We date, uh, in my day, um, there used to be this idea that, yeah, there may be a Miss Right out there, but there is a Miss Right now, right here, right? So this idea of, you know, you find whoever currently is the most compatible person you date, and the jobs are the same. So don't, first of all, confuse yourself with a mystical idea of future love because you don't know who you're going to be. You are evolving. Okay? Um, one of my favorite movies, just because I think it's really funny, is a movie called Hitch. Has anyone seen it? Okay, some people have. I recommend it, okay? 
because I just think it's funny. And it's about this guy who helps um, other men fall in love with the woman they love. Often these men don't believe that they can get this woman because they, they idolize these women. So Hitch helps them become, as he said, the best person they can be. And one of these guys is completely in love with this girl, but he dresses very badly. So Hitch takes him to a tailor and uh, gets him a nice suit, gets him these nice shoes. And then this guy turns around to Hitch and he goes, Hitch, I'm not very comfortable with these shoes. They are not me. Right? So he's trying to say that, you know, he wants to be true to himself. And Hitch turns around and he goes, you right now are an incredibly fluid concept. Okay? Think about that. You right now are an incredibly fluid concept. I.e. that you can change, you can move, right? And we all are. So, right now, trust how you feel right now, go for the job right now that you will love the most, and then later on, as you change, you'll change. But don't let the fear of how you may feel tomorrow paralyze your decision-making today. Does that make sense? Yeah? And when you do that, that paralysis won't be there. Then you'll take that job. If tomorrow you want to become... There was a, uh, I met a couple of people, men, uh, people I mentored in the last uh, 24 hours here, who wanted to be journalists. And I was like, great, do that, right? So maybe tomorrow you want to be a journalist, or as I said, director, or anything. My first contact with a Latvian, actually, and the story of how I came to SSE Riga, is that I met this Latvian uh, young man in London who had left his job with Vodafone um, in uh, Latvia to move to England to become a film director. Right? Imagine. So somebody in Vodafone mobile management one day gave it all up and moved to England to become a film director. And I still remember the conversation I had with him. And it, it was actually changed my life and made me come to life here. It was New Year's Eve. God, it was 2010, four years ago now, I think. Yeah. And um, I'm at this uh, place and uh, I just happened to meet this guy, and we start talking. And he tells me that, you know, a couple of months ago, he packed his bag and come to uh, London to become a film director. And he said, oh, you know, back there he'd been working at Vodafone, etc. So, immediately, I go into my mentor mode. And I say, look, I've never heard of that happening, right? Because, in my mind, the UK industry for film direction is incredibly nepotistic. So people have to know people in order to get ahead. This is all my perspective, I'm saying. I'm not saying it's necessarily correct. But I said, you know, you don't know anyone, you've literally come off a plane, you have no contacts, you have no experience. You can never ever do this. This is an impossibility. You're wasting your time. So he listens to me, right? And uh, then he asks me what I do. And of course, I didn't see the trap, so I said, well, I'm a success coach, I make people's dreams come happen. So he looked at himself, impossible dream, success coach. <laughs> what am I supposed to say at this point? <laughs> so he said, fine, it's impossible, you make it possible. So of course, I had to mentor him, and I produced his first movie. <laughs> you understand, right? And, uh, and you know, so... Two years later, you know, I become a film producer thanks to him, and then because of him, I thought he was such a great salesman, I have to come to Latvia to see what the rest of the country is like. <laughs> and, um, you know, Latvia has had the same salesman effect on me. I keep coming back, I keep coming back, because there is something about this country, and all of you, that has incredible potential. The problem is you can't always see it. And... I remember about a year ago, I was uh, turned the TV on, and I think I came to MTV, uh, just by accident, I was just flipping through the channels. 
And there was this song, and the, I just heard this lyric, and it said, the future's so bright, I have to wear shades. And shades in American means sunglasses. And I just loved it. I realized that the rest of the song was being ironic, it was an indie song, etc. But I loved that line. The future's so bright, I have to wear shades. And I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't know why, it just hit me because with this one girl um, who walked out and she said she couldn't change. And I just looked at her and I, you know, I was thinking about that song and her future. And it's the same feeling I have right now. This feeling that some of you think you're, you're not going to succeed. Some of you have doubts. Some of you have fears. But if you could see yourselves from my eyes, my perspective, you would all need to wear shades. <laughs>